Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Lloyd's One to One, The Currency of the Architectural Mockup by Michael Eidenbenz, published by Gitea. This book is not about the Lloyd's building itself. Rather, it is about the design process that enabled the construction of this London landmark. It specifically addresses the key role of mock-ups, real full-sized models that helped all involved parties minimize anticipated and unforeseen risks of this ambitious project. More generally, this book is about developing novel, buildable constructions, working as a team and solving complex design problems, all core elements of the design process of the Lloyds Building in London. The Lloyds Building, designed and constructed between 1978 and 1986, provides an excellent object of study to show the potential of mock-ups. The late modernist building is considered an immensely ambitious project for its time, still designed with uh, traditional methods just before the advent of the digital revolution. This book reconstructs the design process of the Lloyds building to show how the broad-based design team, led by Richard Rogers and partners, reduced the seemingly unsolvable complexity of their clients' request to single, well-defined problems through an iterative, creative design process. In doing so, the team used the visionary ideas of megastructure and intelligent environment in a building design that relied on novel, yet undeveloped technical systems and constructions. To implement and validate the performance of these technical systems and constructions, the team collaborated with a managing contractor who built individual, selected parts of the building as full-scale models. These mock-ups allowed the team to settle remaining questions and ultimately minimize the risks of the building and its operations. The Corporation of Lloyds, a London-based institution that operates the oldest and one of the largest insurance markets in the world, had outgrown its building repeatedly by 1977. Lloyds knew that the solution to its corporation's complex needs would require intense collaboration with an architect who would lead a team of specialists as a primus inter pares. To overcome its recurring lack of space once and for all, the corporation did not simply commission a new building, but rather sought an architect who would understand its needs and with whom it could develop an enduring design that would constitute the dense and open atmosphere that enables underwriters and brokers of the Lloyd's market to conduct business by maintaining face-to-face -face interaction. Lloyd's was established in the middle of the 17th century in Edward Lloyd's Coffee House on Tower Street in the city of London. As a place where ship owners, traders and venturers could meet, Lloyd's Coffee House not only provided guests with coffee, a new and coveted beverage at that time, it also offered the latest shipping information published on the paper Lloyd's News. Lloyd's Coffee House provided a place for establishing an informal trading exchange between private investors and traders. As trade exchange in Lloyd's uh, Coffee House grew rapidly, it became increasingly institutionalized, establishing rules, its own premises and organizational structures. Lloyd's developed a unique process for how insurance could be negotiated by facilitating the personal contact between all decision makers and knowledge carriers through face-to-face -face business. This style of business has remained a unique selling point of the Lloyd's insurance market, one that even today continues to set Lloyd's apart from competing markets that are almost entirely electronic. Face-to-face -face business makes it possible for Lloyds to quickly customize insurance solutions for complex risks. A hall simply known as The Room is the heart of the market where the face-to-face -face business takes place. It is large enough to accommodate all the people involved in active trading, who establish a dense, buzzing atmosphere. The underwriters sit close together on simple wooden benches called boxes. No specific workstation is provided for the brokers who circulate between the boxes to converse with underwriters. 
The mutual trust among underwriters is the foundation on which business is conducted at Lloyd's. The dense, open atmosphere of the room, which gives all participants an overview of the entire market, facilitates the establishment of contacts and personal exchange, and thus promotes the building of uh, trust among trading partners. The Lloyd's room is thus uh, crucial to the smooth flow of business. Although the high density of people in the room of the Lloyd's building was intended, the market grew so much that the limited space eventually hindered rather than encouraged the flow of business. In August 1977, Lloyd's contacted the client's advisory service of RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects, for assistance in the search for an architect, particularly in organizing competition procedures. However, Lloyds was neither prepared to hand over decision-making authority to a jury, nor was it in a position to formulate its space allocation plan. The space problem was primarily of a logistical nature, so a project first would have to provide answers to the question of how to solve it. At a meeting between RIBA President Gordon Graham and Ian Findlay, chairman of Lloyd's, the latter proposed a selection procedure designed to evaluate a partner rather than a project. The procedure was a novelty of its kind in the British architectural world. A selection of six architectural firms were to analyze the problems of Lloyd's and make proposals. The proposals were to be presented in interviews so that the potential future business partners could get to know each other. In March 1978, Rogers' team contributed per Lloyd's request not a project design, but rather a study that illuminated many different aspects of Lloyd's needs, and thus also reflected the breadth of expertise in Rogers' team. The individual team members not only acted as specialists, but also worked toward an overall solution. In addition to urban, energy and technical considerations, the study primarily explored the expansion potential of the property in outlining a growth strategy. Piano and Rogers gave only vague details about the shape of the new building in the report. Through a comparison of four possible building shapes, a tower, slab, perimeter scheme and deep plan, they concluded that a perimeter development around a central trading area would best meet Lloyd's specifications. The interviews with the commissioned offices each lasted half a day, supplemented by an informal lunch. Rogers made every effort to maintain the impression that he managed an established and healthy company that had moved away from earlier avant-garde ambitions. For the briefing in November 1977, he bought a suit from Yves Saint Laurent and had Piano flown in from Genova for the second presentation. After the second round of interviews, Lloyds appointed Piano and Rogers architects. Its strategy for Lloyds and the well-founded analysis of the problems was the main reason for success. But Lloyds also recognized that Rogers' team was the ideal partner for collaboration because it approached problems similarly and shared a common language. The compilation of the diagrams in which Rogers presented various possible interventions and stages was the key to building trust between the practice and Lloyds. There are 15 sketches illustrating different aspects of the problem and how they might be resolved clearly reflected their sensitivity and the thought that each member of their team had given to the subject. The analogy of Rogers' small community to the society of Lloyd's was obvious. Like Lloyd's, Rogers was convinced that problem solutions must be based on a broad knowledge and experience base. This required a versatile, flatly organized team and, thanks to its proximity, constant dialogue. Following the same principle, new and complex business could be evaluated in the room by collecting and evaluating possible loss scenarios in ad hoc discussions face-to-face -face with various experts. And Rogers' summary of the state of knowledge with the aphorism The one thing we know is that we don't know 
showed Lois that his team had best understood the dilemma. The mutual appreciation of an open discussion culture undoubtedly allowed Roger's team to enter quickly into a constructive dialogue with Lloyd's. Through the selection process, Lloyd's found not so much a solution to its problems as a partner with whom it could further develop the approaches outlined. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for joining me today and see you in the next video. Bye.